Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode we are going to look at a series of spine-chilling ghost stories that all concern spirits well known to the witnesses. These are not strange, creepy monsters. Rather, they are ghosts of their nearest and dearest. Ghosts of their friends and family. And as such, in some cases, that makes them much more comforting. In others, it makes them far more terrifying, as we will soon discover. So, To begin, at the beginning, all of our tales take place in the 1800s, and we will look at them chronologically, starting with the earliest, which concerns a William Thomas from Pen Gethley Esav in Llan Gunnog, which is in modern-day Carmarthenshire. And his mother died when he was around 10 years old, and he had what is described as a very strange experience experience afterwards. Now, William himself didn't live a long life either. He died a decade or two later. But he told his son all about this very strange experience. And what follows isn't so much a first-hand account, but rather his son's version of events. And he tells us that one day, in great sorrow, William went out into a field which was quite close to his house, and he wept bitterly, almost breaking his heart. Suddenly, the spirit of his dead mother appeared to him in a white dress, telling him not to cry, because, saith she, your crying gives me pain, and you need not be in trouble about the future, as there is plenty of food for thee. The child was on the ground when she spoke, and when he looked up, he beheld his mother vanishing suddenly. So a short and sweet and incredibly powerful encounter there with a lost relative. And it's interesting that Assuming the events took place as William's son recalled them, that the mother's purpose for returning to the boy was to assure him that there would be plenty of food for thee, as she says, that he will not starve. And maybe, as well as a ghost story, this is also a reflection of the social circumstances in Wales at the time, when finding the next meal was just as important as finding life after death. In our second tale, which takes place not too far away, just across the border in the county of Cerdigion, in roughly the year 1820, if my maths are correct, the roles were reversed when it was Mrs. D. Thomas from Llanvire and Llandisil who had a daughter who, we are told by another resident of the same parish, was very promising and her mother was so fond of her. She was sent to the well-known school of the celebrated Mr. Davis of Castell Howell. Unfortunately, however, the girl, Mrs. D. Thomas's daughter, died to the great sorrow of her poor mother, who bewailed her loss day and night. But one day, when the old lady was out in the potato field, the spirit of her dead daughter appeared suddenly to her and spoke to her mother with severe looks. Don't cry after me, she said, for I am in a much better place. And this bears a lot of similarities to our first tale. Once again, it is very short, very sweet, but very powerful. This time it's the daughter returning to comfort the mother. Although there's no mention of food this time, although the mother is in the potato field at the time of the events. 
Now, in our third account, this one is recalled by a man in Aberystwyth, but it concerns events that took place sometime before in Carmarthenshire, in the hamlet of Llangella. And if my maths are correct again, and I have to do this a lot on this episode, it's amazing how so many people can remember the vivid details of ghostly encounters, but they can't quite recall what year they took place in. But if my maths are correct, this would have been around the 1840s, and it concerns a man who was working in the parish on the estate of a colonel whose name is hidden, presumably, so they aren't linked with any of these weird stories. And this man, we are told, had, to quote, buried his first wife and married again. He had several children from his first wife, but not one from the second. And one particular day, the children went out to play as they often did. When they came to a certain spot which served them as a playground, they found some small cakes on the ground, which were very tempting to children. And to be fair, not just children. Cake plays quite an important role in Welsh folklore. The Taloith Tig, the fairy folk, are very fond of it. Famously, it's a way of appeasing the Mary Lloyd at Christmas time. And to be honest, it works quite well on me as well. If anyone wants to be nice to me, buy me cake. But I digress. Back to the story. They found these tempting small cakes. And to quote once more, just as they were going to eat them, the spirit of their dead mother appeared on the scene and addressed them as follows. My dear children, don't eat those cakes, for there is poison in them. There is poison in them. When this strange occurrence became known in the neighbourhood, people suspected the stepmother of having intentionally and secretly placed the cakes on the children's playground. And so, once again, we have a ghost story concerning a family member that also concerns food once more, although this time it's lovely cakes, not potatoes. But instead of reassuring a child or reassuring a parent, as with the other tales, this time it's warning them not to eat those lovely looking cakes. And by doing so, if we believe these events took place as we're told, it saved their lives in the process. But things get a little bit darker, much darker, in our next tale. Because while the first trio involved ghosts that could communicate with the living, with their chosen witnesses, you could say chosen victims, using words. What happens when a ghost appears that can't speak? What happens when it's a young baby who has had their life cut short before they are taught how to speak, when they don't have the power of language? And for this next tale, we move further north, up beyond Aberystwyth this time, towards the top of Ceredigion, what was Cardiganshire at the time, in Ashta a crib in the village of Talabont in around 1850 now, again, depending on my maths, and you'll be glad to know that I did pass my GCSE in maths many years ago now, but I did pass it, and I passed it in the Welsh language as well. But in around the year 1850, to quote... The dead body of a little baby was found in a hole or old mine shaft known till the present day as Shaft Ur Plentin, which is Welsh for the child's shaft, which frankly is a truly horrific way of, of dying and of naming somewhere. But hopefully, by giving it such such a horrible name, it did serve to warn other children to keep well away from shaft a plantain. And we are told that, to quote again, the people of the neighbourhood of Talabont guessed 
who the mother was, the mother of this unfortunate baby. And there was a rumour that both she and her family were haunted by the child's ghost. Which, again, is horrific, but that isn't the end of it, because it wasn't just the family who were haunted, because we are told the ghost, it is said, wandered about at night. And its bitter crying disturbed the whole neighbourhood, till many timid people were afraid to go out after dark. Once again, a truly horrific image of the ghost of a baby walking the streets after dark and wailing so much that it scares people to stay indoors. Once more, a very short tale, but a very unnerving tale. A ghost who can simply wander and cry in the darkness. And if we move back down south again, a similar tale of a child's ghost was said to be haunting the small Ceredigion village of Troyd Arair, which in this case is a wonderful name for a village because a literal translation is the foot of gold. Troyd Arair, although while the place name is nicer, the tale involving the child is no less tragic. And to quote, the spirit always appeared as a child dressed in yellow clothes. And on that account, the unearthly visitor was known as Bucky Merlin Bach Akum. That's Welsh for the little yellow ghost of the valley. Bucky Merlin Bach Akum, the little yellow ghost of the valley. But unlike our last tale, this one didn't scream. Quite the opposite. It was deathly silent. And some might say that's a blessing. Others might say it makes it even scarier. And what links all of these tales so far, whether it was these children so young they couldn't communicate, they could only wander, sometimes wailing, or in the case of the older people who passed over, the older children or the parents, they returned to offer words of comfort, or in some cases, words of warning, they all share one thing in common, and that is their lives were ended by circumstances beyond their control. They either ended abruptly, or in the case of some of the older people who passed over, while they still had things they wanted to do on this earth. But what of those who take their own lives? Because Welsh folklore tells us that it was an old belief among the Welsh people in former times that the spirit of a suicide was doomed to walk the earth as punishment. And one of the most famous accounts of this, you could say one of the most famous legends of somebody taking their own life before returning as a ghost, is that of the White Lady of Pont a Gwendraith near Kidwelly Castle in Carmarthenshire. Now, this is a very long tale, and it's one I will be looking at in much more detail in a future episode. But for now, I'll give you a quick summary of the tale. Although, if you really can't wait and you want the whole thing now, you could, shameless plug alert, pick up my latest book, Paranormal Wales, which does include the entire story, plus some lovely pictures. But shameless plug over with, back to this episode and a shortened version of the tale, of which there are several variations out there, goes like this. Nest, the beautiful daughter of the Lord of Kidwelly, was left at home with her older brother Griffith and cousin Gladys when her father went off to the Crusades. And there was a complicated love triangle going on in Kidwelly at the time, or more than a triangle, it was more of a love a love square or a love pentagon if there's such a thing because if you can keep track of this Griffith loved Gladys but Gladys loved 
a Norman lord called Sir Walter Mansell. But Sir Walter Mansell loved Nest, but he was also banned from the castle by the Lord of Kidwelly. But the Lord of Kidwelly had gone away and charged Griffith with looking after his sister and keeping Sir Walter Mansell out of the castle. So it was very much like a complicated medieval soap opera in Kidwelly Castle. But Sir Walter Mansell loved Nest so much and with the Lord away and less chance of being caught, he arranged to meet her in some convenient places after dark in and around the castle. Now, on one fateful night, they arranged to meet on the nearby bridge, that Pont Gwendraith of the title. But Gladys, who you'll remember is loved by Griffith, but she fancies Sir Walter Mansell and so is incredibly jealous of Nest, catches wind of this secret rendezvous and arranges something quite terrible to take place. Specifically, she arranges for Sir Walter to be killed for spurning her, and to be killed in front of the eyes of his beloved. And that is exactly what happened. The murderer was lying in wait and shot an arrow at the night in most of the popular versions of the tale. And as he fell dying from the bridge, Nest jumped in after her beloved. She hurled herself over the side of the bridge into those freezing, flowing waters and as a result was swept away and lost her life as a result. And to quote, her spirit was doomed to walk the earth as a punishment for her suicide appearing as a white lady who would give a wild unearthly shriek and vanish and while this isn't a suicide in the premeditated sense in the sense that she planned it beforehand and it was something she was planning on doing rather it was more of a spur the moment knee-jerk reaction when she saw her love falling to his doom she dived after him romeo and juliet style but nevertheless the result was the same she had taken her own life and as a result her spirit was doomed to walk the earth and anyone who encountered her would hear her wild and unearthly shrieks And as mentioned, while this is an abbreviated version of this tale, in the aftermath, those who had caused the suffering, in particular Gladys and the murderer, they paid by being visited by spirits. Spirits they were very familiar with, although maybe in this case you wouldn't call them their nearest and dearest, even if they were family And of all the ghosts we've looked at on this episode, it is those that wander aimlessly shrieking that are the most tragic, some might say the most terrifying, because they have no words to pass on to us. No words of wisdom, no advice. All they can do is shriek into the void and remind us of their endless torment. And on that cheerful note, I did mention I would be looking at Kidwelly Castle and Kidwelly Ghosts in more detail in the future. And to whet your appetite for that one, I recently discovered this fascinating bit of lore from a local, from somebody in Kidwelly. And it relates to the other famous ghost in the area, a headless woman who is a famous figure from Welsh history and apparently the people of Kidwelly know the exact tree under which her head or rather skull nowadays is buried but that as they say is a story for another day and if you don't want to miss that future Kidwelly episode or any of the other ghastly episodes coming up 
then please consider hitting the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, you can now treat me to a coffee via my website, or you could just leave the podcast a nice review or give it a quick thumbs up or five stars or whatever the options are on whatever platform you are consuming this on. If you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. And as well as a podcast, I've also published a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects, like Paranormal Wales, which features Kidwelly Castle, and which I shamelessly shoehorned into this episode earlier. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Rando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star. No star.